Good evening. Coming up on Pennsylvania Inside Out, the original femme fatale. When Matahari's mummified head was discovered missing from its home at the Museum of Anatomy in Paris, biographer Pat Shipman was intrigued. In her rigorously researched new book, Shipman says the exotic dancer who was convicted of spying for the Germans in 1917 and executed by a French firing squad may not have been pure, but she was likely innocent. Her new book, Femme Fatale, Love Lies and the Unknown Life of Mata Hari, is published by William Morrow. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a you, pleasure to be here. You have a track record of writing about interesting women, and, and Mata Hari may top the list. She's just a fascinating story. How did you become interested in her story? It really was a newspaper report about her head being missing from the uh, Anatomy Institute in Paris. And the fact that the curator speculated for the newspapers that the head had perhaps been stolen back in the 1950s by one of her former lovers. Now, since she was ex executed in 1917, the fact that that many years later somebody would go and, and steal her head back suggested to me that this woman had something just extraordinary. And so I set about trying to find out what it was. Well, it's also ex extraordinary that it may have been stolen. Her head may have been stolen back in the 1950s, but the curators didn't discover it until about 2000. That is probably a little embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, these things do happen in museums with collections that are not being heavily used. And no one anymore believes that you can detect criminality in the shape of someone's skull. So people wouldn't be going and looking at their collection of criminal heads which is what hers was part of. And yes. In fact, she probably really wasn't a criminal. Her only crime was a uh, behavior that was unbecoming for the period in which she lived. Yes, which is part of what's so interesting about her, that I believe she was almost certainly charged, convicted, and executed for being a very sexual woman and openly sexual and uh, living a very luxurious life in a time when people suddenly became more puritanical and uh, self-sacrificing. Now, we know her as Mata Hari, but of course that's not her given name. And we've got this image of this dark-complected, very exotic woman, and that really belies so much about uh, her real uh, birth. Yes, she was born Margaretha Zella in northern Holland, which is a, an area of the world where people very much tend to be fair-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired. Uh, no one's ever traced any um, Asian blood in her ancestry or anything like that. But she was physically outstanding from childhood. One of her friends once called her an orchid in a field of dandelions, and I think that's a remarkably apt description of what she must have looked like in this world of fair people when she was certainly not at all fair. Now she was the first of four children, the only daughter, and she was adored by her father who eventually abandoned her. But as a child, tell us a little bit about uh, her upbringing and her, her, her family. Her father, Adam Zella, was a haberdasher and a very vain man himself. Um, liked to dress well, viewed her as his best accessory, and spoiled her shamelessly. There's a photograph of a goat cart that he had made for her when she was six years old that was, that was like a beautiful carriage, but it was pulled by a pair of goats. And years later, that was remembered in the town as, as just the most fantastical, extraordinary gift for a six-year-old child to receive. He always encouraged her to uh, dress flamboyantly, to be the center of attention, to call attention to herself, and to come into sort of the, the golden aura of, of his adoration. And I think that had a lot to do with her future. <laughs> so you think this laid the foundation for her, what you describe as her insatiable longing for male attention? Yes, I think it did. It has been suggested to me by a number of people that possibly she was sexually abused as a child. There's no evidence. I, I can't even imagine what kind of evidence you would see, but whether it was sexual or simply this extreme adoration that her father showered on her, certainly that, that gave her the, the concept that the way to have a happy life, the way to have a wonderful life was to please men. 
And of course, when he disappeared from her life and abandoned her, that only made it more acute that she had to be more beautiful, more charming, more attention getting and attention seeking. Now, he abandoned her after divorcing her mother. Um, her mother died a couple of years after that, and she was sent by her father to reluctant relatives who really didn't want this, uh, this unruly uh, teenager living with them. She became a mail-order bride. Tell us a little bit about, and it's something you do in many biographers before you have not, and that is really focus a lot on her first marriage and her early childhood. I think those experiences and, and those formative years set the pattern for the way she learned to cope with the world and for the way she felt she might succeed in life. And it was about pleading, pleasing men. When she was sent to relatives who did not find her, I'm sure, an easy young lady to have about the house, as she was very spoiled and very vain, one of the few alternatives open to her was to marry. And so she answered a newspaper ad um, to marry a much older, 20-some years older, military man uh, who was home on leave from the Dutch East Indies, who would be going back. and. I think she felt that this would assure her a life of luxury, of status, um, of honor. And he was also a lot of fun. They both liked drinking and dancing and carrying on. Of course, the marriage turned sour very quickly because he did not stop seeing other women. He continued to drink. He continued to spend more than his salary. He became abusive ultimately, and he gave her syphilis. Which she passed on to her two children. Yes, it was incurable then. There were treatments that were relieved to be cures, but which really didn't cure the disease. However, syphilis is notable because it goes into remission and is sort of hidden, sometimes for years at an on end, and so people don't know they have it. And of course, by the time she discovered she had it, she'd already passed it to her first child, and there was no way to get rid of it anyway. So she passed it to her second. Uh, when we think about the, the legend that is Mata Hari, part of that legend are stories, some of which uh, aren't factual. Um, but tell us about these. Uh, her children, the, the belief is that they died of syphilis, the, the son at the age of two, and the daughter at 21 because of complications of syphilis. Um, but there are others who say that that the young boy was poisoned by his nanny as a, as a baby. Which one do you believe is true? I think it's overwhelmingly likely that he died of congenital syphilis and treatment for it. Uh, the story that was given out at the time was that his nanny poisoned them, uh, poisoned both children. There's no good rationale for why she would poison these children in her care. The, the tie between the, the um, Indonesian babu or nanny and her her charges was lifelong and uh, lasting and, and very deep love and affection. And there was no follow-up. Uh, at the time the child died, there were about 400 Europeans in the town in Sumatra where they lived. The husband, Rudolf, was one of the three or four most important men. He was head of the garrison. And he certainly would have pursued someone if he thought they killed his son. He certainly would have pursued someone, and so would the police, mercilessly, I might add. I mean, I would have expected roundups and beatings and, and trials and all kinds of things because the white population was very sensitive to the idea that there were very few of them and they were in charge and there was a large native population who might, heaven forfend, rise against them. So nobody overlooked anything that could possibly be a crime against particularly a white child. None of that happened. There, there's nothing in the newspaper. There are reports from the governor that catalog his death but make no remark. It's not possible that he was poisoned. Okay. This is Pennsylvania Inside Out on WPSU. Our guest tonight is Pat Shipman, a Penn State professor of biological anthropology. We're talking with her about her new book, Femme Fatale, Love, Lies, and the Unknown Life of Mata Hari. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, her, her execution. Um, Mata Hari never believed that she would be convicted of the crime of, of espionage. Uh, she said, uh, uh, a harlot, yes, but a traitor, never. 
Why do you think she ultimately was? Why do you think her accusers, uh, with very flimsy evidence, uh, were successful in, in bringing her down? I think there are two main reasons. One is the war was going very badly for France, to the point that particular units in the French army were refusing to fight. Uh, there was mutiny going on, and it was perceived as very dangerous because, of course, the Western Front was in France, and so the French soldiers were taking the brunt of really vicious trench warfare. Anything that would make uh, the course of the war at that point look a little less damning was certainly sought for. They needed someone to blame. They also picked a very um, vulnerable person to blame. She was female. She was beautiful. She was highly sexual. She was an accomplished speaker of at least five languages. She lived a fantastically luxurious high life. And she slept with every military officer. And she slept officer, with everyone in town, regardless yes. Regardless <laughs> of what country they represented. Yes. It didn't matter to her. No, I don't think it was important to her at all. Uh, she loved officers. She thought they were a race apart, a gallant gentleman. And um, to some extent, I think she felt her role in life was to make them happy, and she did. <laughs> One military officer actually did come to her defense uh, at trial and said, we talked about music and the arts, but not about war. Yes, I, th I think that is likely to be literally true. One of the things that happened was when these officers, or there were also diplomats and, and high-ranking politicians that she spent time with, when they would get away from the war for a weekend, a night, an evening with a beautiful woman, the last thing they wanted to talk about was the war. They wanted to forget the horrors they had come from, forget the gassing in the trenches, forget the men with shell shock, forget the people sent over the ridge to be slaughtered by the thousands. And they wanted to talk about something beautiful and charming and gay and, and relieving of the guilt and the burden of the horrors of the war. And at one time, uh, Mata Hari's behavior wasn't frowned upon, but when the war started to change, suddenly her behaviors were considered ugly and inappropriate. Yes, she got caught in a time of change. Uh, through no fault of her own, before the war broke out, very early part of the 1900s, was what's known as the Belle Epoque. And people lived lives where they flaunted their wealth, men flaunted their mistresses. Any well-to-do, powerful man would have a mistress, and he, he would be seen in public with her. Um, to have a mistress who was an exotic dancer, who was the toast of Paris, who was considered the most desirable woman in all of Europe, was an, a marvelous thing as far as they were concerned, and it was almost a legitimate role to be that kind of courtesan. So much of her life parallels another famous French woman, and that's Marie Antoinette. Both were executed by the French. Uh, both lost their children tragically. Uh, both sort of uh, put themselves almost unwittingly, naively, into dangerous situations, not realizing uh, that their behavior was, was uh, frowned upon by the public. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's a, it's a parallel I hadn't thought of until you brought it up that seems very apt. Uh, Mata Hari was, as, as Marie Antoinette was, out of touch with common people and what they thought, maybe even didn't care what they thought because she was living in this, in this stratosphere, in this very elite circle of the wealthy and the powerful and the beautiful and the accomplished. And whether or not the people of Paris could get bread or coal simply was not her concern. So that when the war broke out and suddenly people were sacrificing, people were going without food to send it to the soldiers, they couldn't get cloth for clothing because it had to be taken for uniforms. There were not people to work the fields, so there was less agricultural production. All of that really wouldn't um, come into her consciousness. 
she could still live the way she always had. And, and she never figured that she would be convicted, which of course she was. Uh, the prosecutor in the case said, between you and me, there wasn't enough evidence to flog a cat, and yet she was beheaded. Um, and again, that, that uh, her, her killing was actually part of her mystique as well. There are rumors, on, and, and maybe you can confirm for us whether they were true or not, that she refused a blindfold, that she looked at the firing squad in the eye, and that she actually blew a kiss to one of the soldiers. Is that likely to be true? The two accounts we have of her execution, one of which was written by one of the men in the firing squad, um, both include that sort of detail, the fact that she wouldn't be tied to the stake that she stood with what many people have commented on, her beautiful erect carriage. She was a very tall woman and, and stood tall and proud and dignified. I think she felt it was her last performance. After all hope was lost of an appeal, of a pardon, um, that she would not be convicted because she almost certainly was completely innocent of the charges, I think she felt the only way to go out was as Matahari as a performance given by Mata Hari, and she was a very good performer. Mata Hari, how did she come up with Mata Hari, which, which according to your book literally means I, or son of the day, eye of the day? It was a phrase used in Indonesia when she was in the Dutch East Indies with her husband and family. Um, it also was the name of, uh, of a lodge where they, a Masonic lodge, where they probably went uh, they certainly had connections to people who were in the lodge. So it, it may even have uh, meant in, in those circles, um, it may have implied something theatrical, uh, a performance. She needed an exotic name, she felt. She often changed her name until she arrived at Matahari. And to do the sort of dances she did, which were derived from traditional Indonesian dances, but certainly were not traditional Indonesian dances, she needed something that would, that would carry out this theme. And of course, she told people she was half Indonesian or had been trained as a temple dancer as a child or was from, the, from India, not the Indies. I mean, she varied the stories all the time. And you said, to some extent, her changing her identity was part of her undoing. Yes, I, I think it was because she didn't have much regard for the tr truth. She did lie to her interrogators about matters of substance, um, trying to tell them something that they would find more appropriate or more acceptable that might have been the truth, except that it wasn't. <laughs> She was a seductress, yes, and, and many people um, throughout history have thought that women would have the power to change the course uh, of a war by um, getting information from the military. Just how, how seated in truth is that, that women of any age have had the power to do that sort of thing? I mean, you say in a lot of ways she was a ridiculous uh, uh, prospect for a spy because everyone knew who she was. Yes, she, w she was recognized on the streets. Um, there were newspaper articles, you know, gossip column type things about her all the time. Everyone knew who she was. It was the, the best equivalent I can come up with in our era is Marilyn Monroe. Not even one of the pop stars alive today because some of them don't last very long and Marilyn did last, um, at least until she died young. So that there was no chance she could be undetected, unnoticed, clandestine, uh, that that she would not be the center of attention. I mean, that simply was not possible for her. You, you mentioned age and, and Marilyn Monroe. Mata Hari was only 41 when she was executed. Yes. Quite a, quite a young woman. But remember, her dances were performed in very see-through veils, in very few She's clothes. She's lucky she lived that long. And at 41, to still be making a, an extremely good living um, as a dancer wearing few clothes, you know, that's a long run <laughs> for, for a dancer in filmy veils and a jeweled bra. You know, there are countless uh, movies and books and plays, even uh, video games and pinball machine games that all uh, use the Mata Hari image and legend. Um, why do you think she so captured the public's imagination? 
I think to some extent it was the same way she captured men's attention wherever she went. She was enormously charismatic. Um, she had a wonderful power to attract people, to draw them to her, um, even to almost enlist them for her. You know, they became one of a throng of admirers. And she had an enormous ability to do that. Also, in her dances, in her performances, you see how smart she was about what would appeal. She may have been dancing in very few clothes, but she didn't get arrested because they were <laughs> sacred temple dances. Yes, very, very clever woman. And that's going to wrap things up for this edition of Pennsylvania Inside Out. As always, we welcome your response to our programs. You can email us at psu.edu or send us a, a, a letter through 100 Outreach Building. That's University Park, Pennsylvania, 16802. Thanks to our guest this evening, Pat Shipman, Penn State Professor of Biological Anthropology and author of Femme Fatale, Love Lies and the Unknown Life of Matahari. And that is going to wrap things up for this edition of Pennsylvania Inside Out. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.